I'm Caroline Averett from First Moravian Church in Greensboro, North Carolina, and Girl Scout Troop 40172. I'm here with Dr. Nola Reed Knaus, director of the Moravian Music Foundation in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. The Moravian Music Foundation is joining with Greensboro Early Music to present a concert featuring music by Moravian composers. Dr. Knaus. Um, Moravian Music Foundation has several objectives as far as preserving and encouraging research into the music of the Moravians. Can you tell us a little bit about the Foundation's mission and goals? Certainly. The Moravian Music Foundation has a very simple mission statement. Our statement is that we preserve, celebrate, and cultivate the musical life of Moravians. And the preservation happens because we care for a collection of some, something over 10,000 manuscripts and early pieces of printed music uh, in climate control vaults, in carefully designed boxes and folders to keep the physical music safe. So that's the preservation side. You got to take care of it before you can make music out of it. Um, the uh, celebration side comes in producing concerts, uh, and Moravian Music Festivals. The next Moravian Music Festival will happen July 14th through 20th, 2013 in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And it is open for people to join whether or not they are Moravians. Uh, we would love to have people there. There's my plug for the day. <laughs> but uh, we sponsor the Moravian Music Festival. We sponsor other concerts. And we work with performing groups around the country, including things like Carolina Early Music, to perform the music of the Moravians. The cultivation side comes in publishing music, in producing recordings, um, publishing books, articles, a newsletter, doing workshops and lectures, and just helping people to understand the musical heritage of the Moravians. When we, <laughs> when we say early Moravian music, what do we mean and how is that unique? The early Moravian settlers in America, the Moravian settlers in early America, brought with them a classical musical culture from Central Europe that was the most sophisticated musical culture in early America through at least the middle of the 19th century. Uh, they brought with them instrumental and vocal music, some of which they had written and some that they had copied or collected or purchased from the best known European composers of their day. But the music that really bears the name of early American Moravian music is mostly the vocal solos and anthems that were written to be performed during festival music service, worship services, and they were performed with orchestra. So that in, in the 1780s, you could go to church here in Salem, North Carolina, and hear the choir singing a piece with strings, flutes, horns, trumpets, you know, just basically a classical orchestra as part of a worship service. Um, many people who are familiar with the Moravian Church think of brass and woodwind ensembles, but there are also things written by Moravian composers for strings. And how are these received outside the Moravian community? Nowadays, they're very, very well thought of. The string music, the, the two most important pieces of string music written by Moravians are the quintets by Johann Friedrich Peter, and I think we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, three string trios by John Antes, who was American born, but he wrote the trios uh, during or just after he was a missionary in Egypt. Uh, but they are the first known chamber music written by a native born American composer. Uh, but those nowadays are very well known. In the 18th and 19th centuries, they weren't well known. The music of the Moravians in the 18th and 19th century was very well regarded by visitors to the community. Anybody who came to Salem or to Bethlehem, Nazareth, or Lidditz in Pennsylvania was always astounded to hear the quality of the music being played in the settlements. But it, it didn't seem to go outside the town limits. Were, so these composers weren't famous during their life? No, no. There was only one uh, Moravian composer in the early 19th century who was well known beyond the borders of the Moravian church. And that was Christian Latrobe, who I think we're going to talk about more in a little bit. Uh, but the rest of them were not composing for the wider community. They were composing for their own congregation, for use for special services, and their music didn't go, like I said, it really didn't go beyond the town borders except to another Moravian community. 
All right, one of the pieces on the program is one of the quintets by Pater. And can you tell us just a little bit of background about that piece? Sure. Or any of the quintets? The quintets, there are six of them. They were composed in January and February of 1789, about maybe a half a mile from where we are sitting in Winston-Salem. Wow. Written right here. Uh, which is just an astonishing accomplishment to think of something. And they, they are beautiful pieces of music for two violins, two violas, and cello. And I have looked at a fair number of string quintets from the same period, and these will stand up next to any of the others around for, for complexity and for beauty. Uh, I've heard them performed by a lot of different groups, and some of the performances over the years haven't been what we would have hoped for because people didn't take them seriously enough. That's not going to be a problem on this concert. <laughs> These performers are taking this music very seriously, and I think you're going to hear an absolutely gorgeous performance. But Peter was a church musician, first and foremost, and these are the only pieces of music that we know of that he wrote that are not for voices. It's only instrumental music. And we don't quite know why he wrote them, because they wouldn't have been used in a worship service. There's no voice, and the, the, they didn't they didn't play instrumental music during worship. The organ would play a prelude um, or a postlude, but that was usually improvised and based on a hymn that was part of the worship service. But they didn't do instrumental music in worship. They did on Saturday nights, just get together to play. You've got a bunch of instrumentalists. You're going to need them Sunday morning for worship. They're not going to sit around the rest of the week without pulling their instruments out for fun. Right. So, but we still don't quite know why he played, why he wrote those pieces. They had a lot of string music. Yeah. So it's a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> um, Peter's been described as the Moravian's most gifted or accomplished composer. Would you say that that's the case? I think so. Um, I think so. And the reason I say I think so instead of I know so is that of all the Moravian composers, we have not studied all of the works of any one of them yet. We're like, with Peter, we were like, we would, we would be like as if we said, we know Beethoven's music when all we know is two or three of the symphonies, a couple of piano sonatas, maybe one of the operas, mm -hmm. and a string quartet, uh, one, of the, one of the quartets. We wouldn't say we know all of Beethoven's music. Right. Uh, we don't even know all of Peter's music yet. We haven't brought it all out of the vault and put it into modern editions. Uh -huh. The ones that we have brought out are probably the best of the American Moravian composers. The only one that comes close to him is his older brother, Simon Pater, who wrote some absolutely beautiful music. But Simon Pater, during his life, he was a pastor, and he was stationed at congregations that didn't have much of a music program. So he didn't, he didn't write very much. Right. So he was too busy being a pastor and didn't really have the opportunity to work with a lot of musicians. Wow. So he might, have, he might have topped his younger brother, but we don't, we'll never know that. Um, like you said, it was composed kind of close to where we are right now. Was Peter born here in America? No. no, he was born in the Netherlands. He was the son of German Moravian missionary parents um, who were stationed in the Netherlands at the time. And then he went to Moravian schools in Germany um, um, and seminary there. And then he came to America in 1770 at the age of 24. He went first to Pennsylvania and served in Pennsylvania for 10 years and then came to North Carolina in 1780. And he was here from 1780 to 1790, then went back to uh, New Jersey and Maryland and Pennsylvania uh, and lived there for the rest of his life. Wow. Um, also on our program is one of the trios by Johann Daniel Grimm, one of the first generation of Moravian composers. Mm -hmm. What's meant by the first generation of Moravian composers? Well, the, the Moravian church traces its heritage back to John Huss, who was uh, martyred for his attempts to reform the Catholic Church in the early 15th century. And of course, they, the, the, the church was founded by followers of Huss in the middle of the 15th century. And over the next 150, 200 years, they were persecuted uh, heavily uh, and driven underground, nearly destroyed by the Thirty Years' War in the early 17th century. In the early 18th century, some of their descendants found a new home in Germany, in eastern Germany, in Saxony. Um, and that's where the Moravian church had its rebirth. And so Grimm is a composer in the 18th century. The Moravian church was reborn, if you will, in around 17, in the 1720s. Mm -hmm. 
Grimm was born in 1719. So he came into the Moravian Church after, you know, as, as, as in his older years, a little later on. But he, as the Moravian Church was finding its musical voice, he was one of the first to help the church find its voice. And can you tell us a little bit about his trios? Yes, there's a set of them, something like 13 trios uh, for two violins and cello. One of them is for viola and cello and keyboard but uh, most of them are two violins and cello, and they are just lovely examples of late Baroque, early classical string writing. Mm -hmm. uh, Grimm was a teacher of music and actually wrote a, a treatise on music theory, on music notation and composition that was used in the Moravian schools in Germany. But his music, when the music that he wrote doesn't sound like exercises. This is not a teacher's music. This is a real composer at work. So, wow. Yeah. Um, like you said, he came up with some music systems that were taught, and I read that one of those is a lettering and numbering system that's still used today. Can you tell us about yes. that? Yes. This is uh, referring to hymn tunes, the, the chorales that the Moravians sang and still sing and still play in the church bands. Hymns are organized by their metrical structure, by how many lines there are in the hymn and how many syllables there are in the lines and then the accents, whether you start with a strong beat and then a weak beat or start with a weak and then go to a strong syllable. And what Grimm did was he took all of the tunes that have the same metrical structure, say all of the tunes that have four lines of eight syllables of iambic meter and gave those the same number. Those are all the number 22s. And then each one of those in there would have a letter, so 22A, 22B, 22C. And the reason that was practical for the Moravians is that in the 18th century, our hymnals were printed just with the words, didn't have the music with it. And it just would say, above a, a hymn text, it would say, tune 22. And it was up to the organist to say, which tune 22 are we gonna use? And some days you'll use a different one. So we as Moravians nowadays, we still will switch the words to the tunes and the like. And for instance, the, the words that we know to the blessing we sing, we'll sing to a different tune uh, on different occasions. Or even the doxology that we almost always sing to the old hundredth, we can sing it to a lot of different tunes. Because they all have the same meter. They all have the same meter and therefore they're all the same tune number, but they just have different letters. And our band players nowadays don't, don't call the tunes by the words that usually go to it. They call it by the number. Let's play 22H. Yeah. Let's play 151R. Right. <laughs> and, and once they've been playing for a few years, they know those numbers by memory. <laughs> That's really interesting. <laughs> okay, finally, um, the composer Christian Ignatius Latrobe is on the program. And although the Moravian Church began in a province of Germany, Latrobe was English. Mm -hmm. So how did that work? In the earlier years of the, I guess the middle of the 18th century, the Moravians started churches in England as well. Um, and part of that was for the purpose of going to some of the British colonies around the world. So we used England as a, as a jumping off place for our mission work. Mm -hmm. um, and for instance, to come to America, we had to work with the British. It was America was British colonies, right. so we bought land in America from the English. Uh, so the Moravians had an active and thriving uh, churches, several churches in England. Latrobe was German by background a couple of generations ago, mm -hmm. uh, but then grew up. Um, I think I don't remember exactly where he grew up, but he spent most of his adult life in England working as an administrator, missions administrator for the church. Oh, wow. So that's how he tied into the brain. Right. Uh -huh. And like Pater, I read that Latrobe was known to Franz Joseph Haydn, which yes. I thought was very interesting because everyone knows Haydn. Yes. And what was Haydn's impression of him? Oh, this is, this is a fun story. Latrobe and Haydn got, got to know each other through the upper level musical circles in London. Latrobe wrote a set of piano sonatas showed them to Haydn, just for, as you would show them to your teacher to get some advice or help or something. Haydn was very impressed, and he said, you must publish these piano sonatas. Latrobe said, no, 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 they're not good enough. I don't want to do that. No, 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 no. And Haydn said, yes, you must. They're just that good. They need to be available. So Latrobe said to him, all right, I'll publish them, 
if you will let me dedicate them to you. So the Latrobe piano sonatas are dedicated to his friend, Franz Joseph Haydn. Oh, that's so cool. Now, here's a story about them, too. Haydn didn't speak much English. Latrobe's wife did not speak German. Oh, wow. She's <laughs> at home one day. Haydn comes to the door to visit his friend Latrobe. And she doesn't know what to say because she didn't know him. She didn't recognize him, but there's this man there speaking German at her. And he walks in, and all of a sudden he looks, and he sees some of his music on Latrobe's keyboard. And he says, das mich, das mich, ich bin Haydn. <laughs> and she's, so, of course, she's just freaked out <laughs> and sent somebody to get her husband. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so all these composers influenced the way music has developed, but not just in America, but also just music in general. Yes. So is there any, are there any last remarks you would like to tell us about the composers? The joy of the Moravian composers is that they had music in a very proper perspective in their life. Mm -hmm. Music wasn't, for most all of them, music was not their day job. Mm -hmm. They were pastors, they were teachers, they were administrators. They did music because they loved it, they, because they thought it was important, and because the Moravians felt that music was the most effective way to express your faith and to grow your faith by singing together and worshiping together using music. Mm -hmm. So they didn't get bent out of shape over fame. They didn't get bent out of shape over what the critics would think. They, they weren't listening to critics. There were no critics. Uh, they were writing for the people, for their brothers and sisters, for the worship of God. Wow. And I think that holds for the instrumental music as well as the vocal music. Well, Dr. Knauss, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. It's and been a joy to talk with you. <laughs>